Good evening and welcome to our World Environment Day special session on building of greener, cleaner and healthier world in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. I am Kamal Narayan, CEO of Integrated Health and Wellbeing Council, India's premier institution for health awareness, advocacy and behavior change. It is a great privilege to host a session with an all women panel who are playing a pivotal role in protecting our environment and encourage people to take up sustainable living. In a way, they are carrying forward the long history of Indian women standing guard in favor of the environment that began with the historical Chipko movement, one of the first environment conservation movements largely led by women and which is said to have inspired Nobel awardee Bangari Mathai's Green Belt Movement in Africa. There are many remarkable women in India, such as Vandana Shiva or Medha Patkar, who have continuously pursued the case of pro-environment policies, ecological balance, and sustainable practices, much before sustainability became a catchword in pop culture. The role of women in saving Mother Earth from outrageous human activities have given rise to ecofeminism, an ideology that highlights how the subordination, oppression, or domination of both women and the environment are similar in structure. So while the world can decide on its love and hate relationship with climate activists, especially with the young and promising ones such as Greta Thunberg and our very own Lissi Priya from Manipur, we must not miss the deep connection between clean and good environment and human health and well-being. The pandemic has given us an opportunity where the advantages gained in decades can be gained in the next few years and our highly admired panelists today will let us know if that is possible and how we can get it. So let me welcome the esteemed panelists this evening, Dr. Vibha Dhawan, Director General of Energy and Resources Institute, Terry. Dr. Dhawan has served as the Vice Chancellor of Terry School of Advanced Studies and is a Fellow of National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Dhawan is actively involved in research as well as policy development and is a task force member of a number of committees of Department of Biotechnology and others. With a number of successful international assignments, multiple teaching and research and advisory roles in different national and international universities, Dr. Dhawan has been recognized for her exemplary contribution through a series of prestigious awards. We also have with us today Srimati Norma Alvarez, the Padma Sri Awardee Social Worker, Environmental Activist, Lawyer and Founding Member of Goa Foundation. Srimati Alvarez is an advocate of the Bombay High Court and an activist and campaigner on social and environmental issues of public concern. For the past 25 years, she has been pro bono arguing around 200 PILs on environment issues, human rights, women's quality, animal welfare in Bombay High Court, National Green Tribunal, and the Supreme Court of India. We have with us Ms. Dia Mirza, an award-winning actor, producer, UN Environment Goodwill Ambassador, and United Nations Secretary General Advocate for Sustainable Development Goals. As a champion of nature, Dia Mirja dons many a hat with elan and ease. Her exhaustive list of titles include founder member of Club Nature at Wildlife Trust of India, ambassador for Swaksh Bharat Mission Swast Sathi program, ambassador for Sanctuaries Asia's Tiger Conservation Kits for Tigers program, among many more. In a nutshell, she is among the most recognizable environment crusaders globally. We have with us Anumita Roy Chaudhary, Executive Director, Research and Advocacy at Center for Science and Environment. She is among the most authoritative voices 
on sustainable urbanization, clean air action, clean and low carbon mobility, and sustainable buildings and habitats. She has been the force behind Right to Clean Air campaign that has catalyzed several developments. And she is a recipient of prestigious Hagen Smith Clean Air Award from the state of California in USA. And last but not the least, we have Mahua Acharya, CEO of Convergence Energy, a subsidiary of state-owned EESL focused on delivering clean, affordable, and reliable energy. She is a former ACA director of Climate Policy Initiative, leading it in Delhi and Jakarta, and has also held important positions in the World Bank and ArcelorMittal in London. So I welcome again each of our highly accomplished and extraordinary women environment leaders. And let me begin this discussion with a, a simple question to all of you about what it looks like a big silver lining for environment enthusiasts like me. And I will request Dr. Dhawan to be the first in responding this uh, question. So Dr. Dhawan, pandemic has made people realize that there can be threats which may not be visible and can be, cannot be predicted much. Climate change, despite so many warnings and exhaustions from scientists, activists, and despite its frightening portrayal in many of the Hollywood apocalyptic movies, has been not taken seriously by many. And these skeptics include even major nations. The case in point can be even the Americas being, you know, in and out of climate treaties or most importantly, the Paris Agreement. Do you see this changing after the pandemic jolt? Dr. Dhawan, uh, you are on mute, uh, Dr. Dhawan. Could you unmute, please? Thank you, Kamal, uh, for introducing all the panelists and uh, putting such an excellent panel and the topic, which is so important to us. Pandemic has taught us many things. Like when we talk of climate change, and I'll say when the issue was first raised in 1972, and thereafter for almost three decades, more than three decades, it was something like, is it really a threat? And people never took it seriously. It was more of that there were few people who were talking about the climate change. But what we are witnessing today, it has proved that it is occurring and consequences are going to be very serious. So whatever is what happened in Chamoli region or time and again, what we are facing in our hills, that is a clear cut warning. The uh, melting down or breaking down of glaciers, again, it is that, okay, today you may have floods, you may have more water, but what is going to happen to the water security? How will our rivers be fed? So all those problems are very much there. Now, what pandemic has taught us is that your problem cannot be region specific. Now, this virus perhaps originated in Wuhan, we don't know, but now it is everywhere. Which strain is originating where? We don't know. But what is very serious, and doctors are saying repeatedly, is that if the pollution load, if your lungs are weak because of the kind of pollution we are inhaling every day, the chances or the lethality of virus increases, and therefore we need a clean environment. The other thing is that I'll say that it happened so gradual, air pollution, that it became way of life. So staying in Delhi, like we never thought its pollution is less or more. We never saw clear skies. We never ever had chance to breathe fresh air. We look at, there are so many programs, cleaning of Ganga and so on. But during that time, during the time of lockdown, we could see how the clean the water of the river can be. So that teaches us that, look, we have to take action. The pollution has to be, we have to be strict with the industries who are dumping the pollutants into the river. It has to be treated. So it taught us many things. Number one is how much do you need? Very little. So while we are in lockdown, our demands for everything have reduced considerably. 
So therefore, your needs are very less. Number two, you might say you are very advanced in science. You are not. Last year, when it started, we thought that it's going to take few months till the vaccine is there. But it's going to, the, after vaccination also, it has its own challenges and strain is mutating. So whatever you say, there is still a superpower who is controlling you. Bioterrorism can occur anytime and therefore there is a sort of uncertainty. Third is cleaner environment. That is what we should look into and it is possible. So that's what I'll say are our lessons from the pandemic. Thank you so much, Dr. Dhawan, for highlighting this important message. Uh, but the most importantly, what you try to you know, highlight is uh, that the problems of uh, something like pandemic or climate change are not uh, region specific. And it is like we are all, uh, we all are in uh, together in it. So, uh, so let me go to uh, Ms. Alvarez on this uh, the same question. How do you see uh, Ms. Alvarez, you have been seeing a lot of issues. You have been fighting for many of them in the court of law. How do you see? Is it going to be our whole uh, outlook or attitude towards climate change or something which is so, you know, sometimes uh, looks very imaginary? Uh, you, you don't know many of them. It is still very difficult to make them understand there is something changing around you. How do you see? Will the pandemic is going to change this whole attitude? Yeah, let me, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So, uh, so let me begin by just saying that there was a foreword which came to me in WhatsApp, which I want to repeat, uh, which is when all this is done and over, and hopefully it will, COVID pandemic, let us remember that we fought not for money or property or position or power, or the country we will live in, we fought for air. We fought for air, for oxygen. That is what we as a people needed all said and done to survive. This was so basic. And that's why I was quite impressed that you had this program on uh, uh, Women for Good Air Roundtable. I thought, well, this is quite a good choice. Now, about environment and it's, uh, what the pandemic has taught us, very briefly, I think awareness of environment damage was there. I don't think there's anybody in the planet who does not know that our environment is deteriorating. We see it every day and all around us. We see that there are unseasonal rains, temperatures are rising, erosion is there, cyclones, tsunamis, the consequences we see, agricultural devastation, new pests that come in, whole fields which get devastated. We see water scarcity after a year of good monsoons. We see food from the oceans has depleted. So we all know that there is something wrong. But what did COVID-19, what is the lesson we can learn from it short and sweet is that it is not necessarily a slowly debilitating downward slide. As we imagine that ha, next generation aage ho jayega, maybe by that time science will come. It's not necessarily slow. It is an overnight slap in the face of humanity. Really a wake up call which says wake up you have crossed the line already. You have done too much of damage. And so the insight which we take is that nature is kind, mother nature benign, but nature is also severe and can be very harsh. If in nature there are species which have got eliminated, which have gone the dinosaur way, we don't see them anymore. Let us learn from it that if we don't take care of ourselves and if we don't watch what we are doing, we could be next. If we don't learn that, then we have learned nothing. Because we have placed a lot of our hope, faith, trust and the actions we do 
on science and technology. We believe that science and technology will rescue us from anything that we do to nature. If we exhaust the water, we say, okay, desalination plants will come up. If we remove the forests, we say, never mind, we will find another way of in, you know, beautifying the greenery around us. In Goa, we have got recently a, 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 a scenario where in the wildlife sanctuary which exists, the government has approved three infrastructure development projects running through the wildlife sanctuary, cutting it at three points. What are you going to have left of a wildlife sanctuary which is protected specifically for animals? So I think we have to stop fooling ourselves that we have the answers to everything and we have to learn humiliation, be humble. We have to know that like all the creatures in the earth, we stand before nature with a begging bowl. We stand before nature to say, let us take what you can give us. Let us share it with the animals, the creatures around us. Let us not believe in our predominance. Let us be humble because there is no point in the save the earth t-shirts. The earth will survive. We will not be there. So don't worry about saving the earth. The earth is strong. It is we who have to ensure that we don't inflict such wounds on her that nature will turn back upon us. This Thank you. thought is what I would like to say. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Alvarez. It's very important and I think poignant message that and not only people uh, fought for air, people died for it. People, you know, kind of uh, could not survive in absence of uh, the air or what, you know, the, the oxygen which we needed at the time of pandemic. Uh, Dia Mirza, uh, Ms. Alvarez is saying that uh, we can't fool uh, ourselves anymore. And it is not the question of uh, saving the earth. It is the question of saving the humanity, uh, saving ourselves. How do you see that? Uh, because in pandemic also, what happened? The first wave came, the second wave, we were, you know, kind of completely mentally out of the pandemic. And not only we, I mean, uh, the people who were supposed to guide us, uh, they were also in a way kind of uh, uh, thought that it was an end game of the pandemic. How do you see, uh, is it going to be something much serious, uh, you know, kind of uh, action going to be followed? after such a jolt which the humanity has got around the globe? Dear Mirja. Thank you so much for having me, Kamalji. It's um, a real privilege to be a part of this conversation, especially with these incredible ladies who I really admire. And uh, it's admirable that you've brought us together. Thank you. Um, I think uh, to answer your question, I have to include the fact that it is human arrogance and our ego that has led us down the path that we have, where we've assumed that we can continue to plunder the planet and gain from it. Um, and it is this very arrogance that has created the pain and the heartache and the hardship that human beings have experienced in the second wave. And I do hope with all my heart that all of those in government and policy and everyone who uh, assumed that this is a, a wave or a pandemic that would, you know, that we would be able to bypass or overcome easily uh, will, 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 would have learned some humility and some grace and understood that we cannot continue to work and live and eat and function the way we did before the pandemic struck. Um, it's important to point out three things before um, I, I, I kind of elaborate on this point. One is that pre-pandemic, we were fighting for three things, right? Three planetary crises. One was the nature crisis. The second was the pollution crisis. And the third was climate change crisis, right? Um, and unfortunately, we were struck by this global pandemic where millions and millions of lives were lost millions of lives and communities and, and people uh, were affected and continue to be affected and jobs were lost and there's there's been all kinds of setbacks on the sustainable development goals because of the pandemic 
Now, did all the other three crises that we were dealing with before the pandemic struck get a pause? No. They continued to and continue to exist. While many of us have celebrated the anthropause or what we call the great pause when uh, human activity was stalled or halted for an intermittent, a short period of time that led many people to look around and say, oh my God, I can live in India and breathe clean air. My air today, my AQI levels today are better than AQI levels in the Swiss Alps. That was unimaginable for a Delhiite or a Mumbaiite, right? Um, and, and people registered things like that during the lockdown. They looked out, they could hear bird song for the first time in their lives. They, they, they could see blue skies again. They could see that animals and nature were re resuming activities of going back to areas that they had completely abandoned. There have been incredible social media campaigns and images shared across global commun with, with global communities on how dolphins were seen in Italy and you know there were other animals seen in other parts of the world and we were celebrating. So did people recognize the fact that there is a connection between human activity and environment? I hope so. But have people really registered the fact that it is our alienation from nature? It is our broken relationship with nature. It is our exploitative attitude towards nature. It is our arrogance, our greed and our egotism that has caused this devastation and all the others including climate change and the uh, and the nature crisis and the pollution crisis and this pandemic uh, i hope i hope we have realized that because unfortunately i still see policy not reflecting that understanding i as a citizen of this country and this planet it breaks my heart to continue to see that large areas of land are still being allocated in our forests for diamond mining, Bukswaha. Uh, that like uh, Norma ji mentioned, there are three infrastructure projects that somebody wants to set up in a wildlife sanctuary in Goa. But the good news, I think, Kamal ji, is that the youth of this country is awake, it's resilient, and it's ready to fight hard which is why we've seen more environmental action in the past year and a half than we've perhaps seen in the history of our country. And this to me is, uh, this to me means a lot because I feel that even those working in government have their hands tied sometimes and they need, they need us, you and me and the youth of this country and the women of this country to come forward and give them the faith and the strength to take the right actions. Certainly, uh, Dia, you have very well, you know, underlined the fact that, but the problem is that many times, uh, not only the governments, the industry, each one of us are waiting to go back to the, the, the same, you know, the pattern which we were following before the pandemic. And that is the problem. The, the, the one thing I think everyone is waiting is to just go back to the, uh, you know, the, how we were earlier. Why, what we must be realizing that what are the new ways of living, living in harmony with the nature so that we are not going to get this kind of jolt again or a much bigger jolt which may be waiting for us. Anumita Rai Chaudhary. Uh, we talked about I, it, all, uh, you know, two speakers at least mentioned about Delhi. Uh, you have been extremely involved in the whole vehicular, uh, you know, pollution, uh, which is which has been causing the uh, the deteriorating air quality of our national capital, and you have been advocating against it. Uh, we have seen the actions which were supposed to be emergency actions, such as odd even or something like this, which was vehemently opposed in a manner by most of the people. And for many of them, despite you have, uh, you know, kind of apocalyptic sky out there, people don't feel that why, why there is a need to rationalize the, you know, uh, the, the traffic on the road. Now, during the pandemic, they have all 
many of them voluntarily have decided to pack themselves in their houses and the cars are kind of you know getting dusted out in their parkings do you see that the the actions which were supposed to be taken to tackle the you know growing uh, level of pollution in delhi air or any other city of our country people will be more cooperative to take these kind of actions or governments will be more willing to put those curbs when we will coming september again will be having a polluted air outside in our cities or maybe especially the national capital anumit thai thank you so much kamal ji and uh, it's great to be here part of everyone to have this <clears throat> great conversation um the question that you have raised is absolutely so pertinent and uh, particularly keeping in mind that everything that you have said which is that we have so far been living in a denial right that even though things were happening all around us we were facing the problem of air pollution people dying but we really wouldn't acknowledge that and take action as that's needed but to answer your question i'll first step back a little to first flag off the issue that in this unprecedented humanitarian crisis you know where each statistics is actually a traumatic personal story and the question for us is that can this experience really change us force us to rethink and do things differently that's the question we are asking and that's where we are going to look for our solutions in the future because one thing we have understood very well that if we we have to respect the health and the environmental boundaries of economic growth that's very clear for us but as everyone uh, who has spoken already they have highlighted the fact that we cannot also let a crisis go waste we have to learn from the crisis and the like the and this crisis has many lessons for us and particularly as this is a grand unintended experiment you know that's what i call so when i look at it from that perspective what is very clear to me that when we are looking for solutions to air pollution so that is a specific question that you raised for me one clear lesson for us is that we cannot ignore and neglect science anymore you know year after year we have been getting the data on global burden of disease saying telling us that how many people are falling ill and dying because of air pollution in this country that it is the top killer that the largest number of children below 5 years of age infants and even fetuses are dying because of air pollution but that never gave us that jolt we did that did not shock us right but now today when we are all like falling dead you know i mean just with the whiff of the air this one big reminder to us today is that and the new science which has also made this very crucial link they're saying that pandemic effect can be higher in polluted regions where people's lungs are already weakened due to the long term exposure right and and in fact we now we have data from different parts of the world which is telling us that uh, look if the population was less exposed perhaps you would have seen lesser effect maybe you could have avoided some deaths now having said that and we now even have data for um, india and now the even bigger shocker that lancet gave us recently saying that perhaps the covid virus is perhaps airborne maybe it's all around us we are inhaling it right so suddenly what nora said about oxygen and you know and what lia and vipha they highlighted about the whole challenge of this is that it is somewhere <clears throat> getting drilled into our mindset in a, in a somewhere in our consciousness that we have to now respond very clearly and deliberately and aggressively to the to the challenge that we are looking for but at the same time what we are um, really most worried about and as you gave the daily experience that 
It's just not the science, but daily experience has also taught us that air pollution battle is not easy to fight. It's not easy to win, <clears throat> sorry. And it is, we have seen, it's a 20 year old battle where, where we have, there have been some wins, we have lost something, but overall, the message that we have today, that even though Delhi may have done several things, I mean, it's not a small thing for a city to, you know, to eliminate the old vehicles, do CNG, get BS6, eliminate dirty fuel from the industry. With that, it has seen some change, but the bigger lesson for the entire country from the Delhi's lesson is that, and what the pandemic has also taught us, is the speed and the scale of action that we require. When all of us, when we so-called celebrated the blue sky during the hard lockdown, that should have told us and given us the message that that blue sky was possible then because we had shut down our economy. But you cannot shut down your economy for a clean blue sky. You need systemic changes. You need hard action. You need to take difficult, inconvenient decisions. And that's what links me to your questions very specifically. Because today in Delhi or in the rest of the country, the new generation solution that we have to go for, these are very difficult. Soft options are over. It's about, I have to say no to my car. Pandemic has taught me that it, the micro travel is more important. Walking, cycling is more important than getting into the car. Pandemic has taught me that it's not the air-conditioned closed space that keeps me safe, but it is the well-ventilated, well-designed house, thermally comfortable house that keeps me safe, right? So understand okay. how this has challenged us. It has challenged our established understanding of development, and it is challenging us to do things differently. So we have to reshape our energy system. We have to redefine our mobility patterns. We have to understand the complete circularity of waste management, and we have to build our habitat safely. And the final word that I just want to say, the pandemic's lesson has also been that we are destroying the boundary between the humans and the wild. And the experience with the development that is destroying our forest, that is also exposing us to the virus and the pathogens. The zoonotic disease which WHO today is saying, yeah. That all the new disease today, seventy-five percent of that would have zoonotic. I'm sorry to... for interrupting, but I will be taking this question to Dr. Viva also. She is a bi biotechnologist, so uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we would like to hear from her also. So let me go to Mahua uh, now. On Mahua, uh, so we heard you know so many uh, regions that why uh, we will be acting better now post pandemic. You have are trying to uh, you know kind of bring in that uh, grassroots solution of uh, making people uh, get the clean energy or clean clean energy based uh, you know support system around them. Uh, how do you see? Will the you know the the acceptability uh, reliability of these solution is going to increase post this pandemic? Will the uh, government be more uh, you know or let's say other uh, uh, agencies also be more willing to invest in something which is giving a, a long term yield of uh, having a much cleaner uh, you know energy uh, dependency more sustainability how do you see this what has changed uh, you know after pandemic in terms of your area of work firstly thank you kamal ji for having me at this event uh, and I echo what Dia was saying. It's so it's so nice to start, to see so many incredible ladies here. I'm um, I'm really not at events like this. I'm usually at events where I'm the only woman, and I have the privilege, as they probably think, to be addressed as Sri Mahuacharya. So it's really nice to be at this at this kind of event. Uh, what has changed? So. I, I mean, for the benefit of, for, uh, benefit of others on this panel, my job right now is to build out a new company. I chose uh, to take the leap into government because I feel, I felt that some point in my career, I'd like access to 
impact at scale. And the government and its architecture and its systems allows me that. What has changed? I think everybody is saying here the tsunami, I mean, the, the pandemic hit us like a tsunami. Um, it still goes on. I, I, it, it's still going on in the country. Delhi has crossed its uh, worst probably patch ever in its history. And others, other uh, cities are doing the same. Has it been a wake up call? Yes. So let me answer your question very specifically from where I sit. Has it been a wake up call? Yes. Um, has it uh, pushed sufficient change? Too early to tell. Has it, in, in, and this is in my area of climate change and energy, um, has it triggered government agencies, which is whom I deal with now completely, to legitimize solutions for air problem and pay a little bit more because a lot depends on that last critical component. I'm heartened to say yes. Um, it's too early to, um, to, to generalize, but I'm optimistic because we have reached in our climate change work and in our energy work in this country, we've reached a point where Technically, we, we have a reason to do things differently, not morally, not environmentally, not any of those things. I'm an environmentalist by training and in my heart, but I also have to achieve large scale change. So I have to work in ways that work. Technically, we have to get past this hump. And so we are ready to embrace large scale renewable energy. So that's it. When you get into a discussion on that piece, rural clean energy, large scale clean energy, and when you get into the discussion at scale, it's not impossible to add air pollution into it. Let me give you an example. One of the things we're trying to do that I'd really, that's my personal ambition, is we're trying to get into villages and, and to change the electricity system. So put up renewable energies, uh, renew energy systems in rural areas. And the hypothesis is that we're in the business of putting up this renewable energy anyway. And we're going to be there for 25 years. We may as well also invest, explore whether other appliances can be given to homes because we are now the renewable energy provider of people's homes. So can we change the cooking solutions? Because indoor air quality is a very, very serious matter. I'm not even talking about external air quality. Just indoor air quality. Can I come in and just change the way people operate their cooking systems? in areas of Himachal, in areas of Ladakh, where in fact, just started a project in, in Goa. I, before pandemic, I used to come to Goa every two, uh, two weeks, still exploring. So have things changed? They're moving in the right direction. But if I were to say, um, what, if, there, if there were three other things needed, one would be sustained effort from people like yourself, from people like all ourselves, sustained uh, reminders that look, the air pollution problem is not gone away because it's not October in Delhi anymore. And it's not gone away because it's not in my AQI today is less than 100. In Bangalore, where I come from, it's about 42. So I feel good for the day. And until the crisis remains on me every single day, and we as Indians are so used to dealing with crisis that unless it remains a crisis, we don't seem to do anything about it. So that's one. The, there is a, there's a add on. We need this groundswell, right? Our systems of change, our systems of implementation and execution are based on individual action towards larger systems. So to give our own policymakers, our own execution agencies, the faith and the strength that they need that allows them to justify and legitimize a public problem needs sustained groundswell. And it has to be sustained. I'm looking for anybody to try and to do that. The youth is definitely coming up. Um, the number of, of quote unquote young people who are willing to forego jobs in, in, in areas and sectors that when I was coming out of college, there's no way my parents would be pleased with me um, if, I, if I said I didn't want to do management consulting. So I ran away from the country to, to study something else. But they're willing to do that. 
And I'd like to capture that enthusiasm. I'd like to capture that grit. I'd like to capture and give them some sense that there are people who are listening to them. And today I'm about 20 years older than them. And about 20 years from now, when I'm finishing off from less than 20 years from now, when I'm finishing off from this work, I should be able to at least feel like I have given the support system for this new generation to come in and say there is actually, it's a fairly, it's not as unreceptive. It is a fairly receptive. It is a human problem that we are looking at. So I'd say these are the three things. So sustained effort. So really, again, back to you. Thank you for putting this panel together. Thank you for thank getting all of us together. Thank you so much, Mawap. And uh, definitely, you know, a lot of optimism is coming from your statements that, you know, uh, things are moving in the right direction. And there definitely uh, there is expectation and uh, hope that uh, they will be taking further momentum. Uh, thank you so much, all of you, to highlight that what are the lessons we have learned uh, during the uh, due to this pandemic and what all can trigger a, a larger or more serious action uh, to be taken to uh, do the course correction and uh, now let me just spend the next 15 minutes of this show to uh, understand a little bit of more specific uh, uh, you know issues which are or which may be staring uh, on us uh, for the future. And let me go to for this uh, to Dr. Vibha Dhawan. Uh, Dr. Dhawan, uh, uh, Anumita uh, briefly mentioned about those all deforestation and how uh, the, the, the human and wild interaction is happening uh, and which is, which is probably one cause of uh, this pandemic we are in. Uh, there are multiple other theories as well, but if we stress it's, it's origin to the nature. Definitely, this is an outcome of uh, the wildlife uh, interaction with the human uh, species. Same has been with the Ebola, where also you know uh, the similar kind of origin was uh, established. If we continue to do what we are doing, you know, deforesting in large scale for many of those plants or, uh, you know, uh, projects which uh, Ms. Alvarez also mentioned about. Or trafficking wildlife. Yeah. yeah. Trafficking wildlife also something. Yes. And trafficking uh, wildlife uh, or messing up with wildlife in all possible manner. Is it, uh, are we staring at or we are creating pathway for many such pandemics to come in future? If we continue to do what we are going to, we have been doing, and what is going to be the probable stop for it? Dr. Dhawan, you are on mute. Dr. Dhawan, you are on mute. Could you unmute, please? Thank you. Uh, well, really speaking, what we are looking at and recognized by UN also, but more than pandemic, what we are facing today, different the floods, tsunamis, and so on. So that is more connected to the uh, deforestation. Now, deforestation, if we look at that's largely happening because of either infrastructure projects. It's also that we are uh, uh, drawing uh, either forest. Uh, wood or other valuables, medicinal plants and so on from the forest and it is free for all kind of a thing. The medicinal plants, the way they are sold, it is basically extraction cost and those species are also getting extinct. One important thing that we have to look into in this pandemic time, although it has reached uh, villages, rural India, but still the way it spreads largely because the immune system is far better than immune system of those of us who are living in cities. It's partially related to the air we breathe. It is also related to the food we eat and our lifestyles because our lungs perhaps, except for the hour we spend in gym, we are not bothered or we don't undertake any other exercise. So that's another way of looking at it. The other one, the question which you asked, are we going to face more pandemics? The answer is perhaps yes. 
if we look what happened in the past or the way this virus is evolving every day we are calling that so and so mutant we are giving different names to the mutant and we are saying that this particular one is more infectious 50% more infectious whatever the virus also wants to survive and that's the case like if we look at the pesticides uh just look at one crop that's uh, cauliflower so the it uh, it it gets infected and for last and the number of insect pests they are increasing year by year and so is the pesticide concentration like you must have read couple of years back don't eat uh, cabbage at least raw because it's laced with pesticide so we are bound to spray more pesticides on that crop that has largely happened because we are spraying pesticides and the next the insect evolves it gets used to a particular dosage it gets used to a particular chemical and then there is another uh, strain and let's remember because see if we say life span uh, in case of virus bacteria fungi so their life span is few hours so within one within 3 to 4 hours there will be a next generation so they evolve much faster so pesticides or rather i'll say uh, there seems to be some problem in uh, dr dhawan's connection dr dhawan i'll be coming back to you let me just uh, go to dia uh, with uh, you know another important question here uh, uh, dia the whole theme of uh, this uh, word environment day is to reimagine restore recreate uh, how do you see that how we are going to achieve this as a systemic level to effectively combat the you know the impact of climate crisis or uh, you know we actually need to recreate the forest uh, we have so mercilessly removed or what all what are the those small actions uh, which has a you know power a people power can contribute to this apart from what can be done on a macro level in terms of uh, uh, you know large scale systemic changes how each one of us can contribute to that uh, in in this specific uh, area of reimagine restore or recreate Uh, thanks for the question kamalji i think it's important to understand that science has uh, evidenced the fact that because of human activity and the way we uh, produced and uh, consumed uh, mindlessly and um, so destructively uh, we are where we are at right now uh, which is um, we've having degraded a serious amount of uh, land and water and uh, uh, areas of uh our planet that need to be restored and need to be regenerated for uh the sake of our survival which can only be possible if we bring back the balance of ecosystems that this planet had for millennia right uh which is why the the this new decade of action has been launched today the un ecosystem uh re- restoration action uh a decade for action and um the hope is that 1 billion degraded hectares of land will be restored and uh essentially there are many important action points but what this campaign does forward that has been launched today alongside the decade of action is a uh, generation restoration and uh, for those of us who are watching this program i uh, encourage you to look up what the generation restoration is it essentially highlights the fact that we don't need to wait for industry government policy makers to make a difference at an individual level we can also support and be a part of generation restoration and essentially what we can do by being a part of this is to encourage uh, greater greener spaces in our urban centers so to uh, engage with corpor- co- uh, our corporators work with our municipalities and also at an individual level just plant more indigenous trees uh, green uh, whatever area we have access to whether it's a window in our apartment or a patch of land whatever that may be plant more trees 
Uh, the second thing that we can all do at in, an individual level is to support organizations, uh, government and non-government that work and fight for the protection of forest land and forest people and wildlife. Um, and these are important ecosystems that support everything that we need for our existence. Uh, the third thing that we can do is to manage our waste better. I think Anumita ji mentioned that point. I think it's a very important and very critical area and aspect of beating pollution and dealing with pollution, managing uh, and, and restoring our ecosystems. Uh, so we can, at an individual level, learn to manage our waste better, segregate and compost. And if we can go beyond composting, even better. Uh, the, thir the fourth thing that each and every one of us can do is to embrace a plant-based diet. We don't talk about this enough. We really need to talk about this a lot more. Um, and then, of course, uh, there are many, many more solutions and actions that we can take at an individual level. But these are the four that come to me at the top of my mind that I can share and that I myself practice and I, I believe can really benefit and help um, the planet, heal the planet, because wherever communities are taking action, we are seeing a big, big difference. And there are exemplary examples of citizen groups that are making a difference in these areas. So I hope that we will all be a part of generation restoration because none of the sustainable development goals are achievable without restoring uh, the balance of our ecosystems. And uh, we can't hope for clean air to breathe or clean water to drink or food to eat without this balance. So this is why ecosystem restoration is so important. Thank you so much, uh, Dia, for highlighting all these four points. And, and they are all, I think, each one of us can practice them at our home, at our community. Uh, I'm sorry, so much. I want to quickly add, very sorry, yeah. uh, which is why we're encouraged to reimagine uh, recreate and restore oh. simply because we don't want to go back to the old normal of how we lived. We need to create a new normal, uh, which is the at with the attitude and the understanding that we are now in restoration mode. We need to give back to the planet what we've taken from her. Thank you so much. We, we have to be on restoration mode. And I think with the uh, in such a wonderful women leadership around us in certain, you know, uh, uh, pivotal uh, roles, definitely we are going to uh, make this uh, res gen restoration generation a much more uh, uh, buzzword, not only buzzword, but uh, something which will inspire action all across. Thank you so much, Dia, for joining us on this. Uh, let me just quickly go to uh, Ms. Alvarez. Uh, since you are a uh, law practitioner, Indian constitution is, I think, among the very unique constitutions, which somehow also put a kind of constitutional obligation on the governments and the people of uh, the country to protect the environment. And it is, you know, kind of enshrined in our uh, duties uh, in the constitution. But uh, you have been practicing law. How much of it is actually abide by all stakeholders? Uh, including from people to the government. And do you see that uh, being environment friendly can become a more like an unskippable duty? Uh, is there a way to do that? And especially maybe uh, the, 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 the pandemic uh, jolt or uh, wake up call might have given that opportunity? Sorry, Kamal, I have to leave. And others, I'm so sorry, I have to leave my uh, the minister has arrived at my event. No problem. No problem. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you so much. For, we will have another opportunity to interact more. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I'm sorry. This is the only time the minister has come before time. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. No, no problem. No Very problem. nice to meet thank all you. of you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Ms. Yes, yes, Mr. Kamaljit. Uh, we, ha we do have some of the most extensive laws covering practically every every facet of life. And yet, we are where we are. We have wildlife laws, we have forest protection laws, we have air quality laws, water laws, environment laws, prevention of pollution, and so on. But uh, 
we human beings are very anthropocentric we believe that we are at the top of the universe at the peak of the universe of the planet and uh, although our uh, our dharmas teach us that there are other living beings buddhism hinduism jainism give 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 us an idea that all of us are part of this planet personally we think that we are the kings and the queens and that we rule everything and so we make laws that favor us and whenever there are projects and whenever there are uh, uh, there are uh, implementation uh, programs that come up we do not look at the impact on nature around us as much as we should we pay some token uh, token uh, recognition of it by introducing what we call mitigation measures which means that we understand that this will impact certain areas critically we understand that it will impact wildlife critically and we don't say that oh since it will impact this so much let us not do the project we say instead let us mitigate but mitigation is twofold it is a recognition that you are damaging that's the first thing and that your damage will be there and then it is trying to put a token kind of a uh, chain so it, it, it's like uh, saying that we will imprison whole sections of people and then we will mitigate it by giving them you know little dessert every alternate day something like that you know you you we will keep them in, but we'll give them a little bit you know cold drink some days and we'll do things like this that light are the mitigation measures so while we have the laws we have too many loopholes also there are too many provided that provisos they they the laws uh, take the coastal regulation law a strong law but then 50 117 amendments to it why because industry found it difficult because people found it difficult so when you have a good law which has come up after putting it before the public after getting feedback and you say this is the law then you start changing the clauses watering it down so that you get a weak practically worthless law and whatever you try to get through the court you will find that there is another loophole within the law and i i i i don't know if the law makers and government will recognize that the you know we all pray for the situation to change we hope that we will get out of the pandemic but while we pray for the situation to change we forget that the situation has been designed for us to change that is this, that is what we have to take home not that this will go away and we will be back to normal but that this is something which compels us to change and government has to remember for instance the public trust doctrine i was reading it just this afternoon in preparation for a case which may come up in the following week where somebody has built a whole construction on a beach saying that i want to protect my property and we government is still taking 3 weeks to consider consider what is to be done now the public trust doctrine for example says that the government is the custodian of all the public assets that are there which means that it has to protect them for the public not squander them away not give them away not say i will look into it but zealously strive to protect it so environment laws are there i can only hope i am not as optimistic as mahua has been about she can see change happening i still cannot see it happening but i i i hope fervently that this pandemic has at least taught us that animals nature is as important as us that we need to respect them and if there are certain things that the individual can do which i would like to take uh, take forward from what dia said i would say purify the environment around you see that the environment around you is wholesome trees are planted things are there which are good you can't do everything in the city i do understand it 
Secondly, take care of your health. I think we rely so much on outside medication, on the vaccinations, on the oxygen, on things that are input into us. But we need it to strengthen our lung system. We have a whole system of yoga. We have got pranayam. We have got so many things. And yet, it's are not advised by doctors. Change. Put in half an hour, 45 minutes to improve your own health. Do something about your own health. And third is be mindful of our lifestyle. Be mindful. Watch what you're doing. Think about what you're doing. Support organic because organic doesn't damage the planet. Look at, uh, look, look at what, what the actions that you will, will take, how they will impact. Lessen your transport. Reduce it. Stop thinking about coming to Goa every second weekend for your honeymoon holiday. Change that. These are some of the things I think that I hope will bring some sense back into the planet. And I do hope government will take a cue from it. The, the last suggestion may be very difficult to follow <laughs> because, uh, you know, everyone is just, you know, kind of dying to, and at least I'm going to be the first one to come to go whenever we come to. The capital of the world of India. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Anumita, uh, let me just come to you for the last remark on this. Um, see, uh, uh, Ms. Alvarez mentioned about health. And this pandemic is all about health. And somehow, a health which has always been at the base of our priorities have become the top priority uh, for everyone. Uh, but there has been many pandemics going on slowly and steadily. Uh, your recent report from Center for Environment and Science, you know, which is a state of India's environment uh, report, highlights that around 32% uh, of lung cancer deaths, uh, uh, you know, uh, caused because of uh, the bad air, or the 60% of the COPD diseases or deaths were also caused by the polluted air. Globally, the numbers are much more higher. Uh, you know, for example, I think that is around uh, 67, 6.67 million deaths attributed to bad air. The, the, as I said, there, there are multiple uh, pandemics going on. Cancer, for that matter, in 2020, killed more than 10 million people, while pandemic itself has killed hardly 4 million. If we compare, even one life is important, but we are talking about millions. How do you see that since now we are much more awakened towards the health, will the, the, the whole premises of that, if you want to live, at least let live what is around you. Let live the, the, the animals, the birds, the plant, you know, the, the trees, everything around you, you have to have much more harmonious. Will it drill down some kind of those messes and we will get some action or we will get at least health becoming the priority in the future or again back to the basics uh, i'm getting skeptical a bit on this because uh, the last experience was not that great i believe that uh, know, things are going to be much more on track because we haven't got one jolt we have got a secondary jolt also absolutely kamalji and so right so you're very right that today what we are called new normal and uh, the whole uh, and whether we have the legal framework what Norma pointed out uh, to move towards that sustainability and health being central to it. So to answer your question Kamalji, let's keep in mind that yes, you're very right, multiple pandemic going on at the same time. We call it double or triple burden of disease burden that India is suffering from right now. So one, the whole traditional risk from the infectious diseases, we have not been able to deal with it because of our unhygienic environment. We, are, you know, we have not been able to build safe urban habitat and so many reasons not being able to give clean water, managed waste. So that disease burden related to dirty environment is still very big in India. And bef even before we could deal with it, we are now caught in what you call the cancer epidemic, the new risk, the modern risk associated with the new growth and the toxic risk because of pollution that has started to happen. It is absolutely ironical, Kamalji, that when this is happening, if you look and read our 
Air Act, the Air Pollution Act, the legislation that governs air quality in this country, you will not find the word health in it, right? So it's not even part of a regulatory focus. Health ministry does not have a legislation. They only have policy. So there is nothing enforceable about health. Now, how do we therefore move forward? So while we have so much of health evidence coming to us, we do not know how to respond to this because like other countries have, they have very clear system of integrating health criteria in their decision-making processes. So when they take decision, they don't look at only at the economic cost of implementation. They also look at the health benefit of that implementation. And therefore, when industry says, oh, it's going to be too expensive for us to implement, then the health benefit argument is given to say, it may cost this much to you, but the society is going to get much bigger benefit. So I think now post pandemic, we have to move in that direction. You know, even though we are facing so much problems on ground because a lot of things are not getting implemented, but our policies are changing very rapidly and the right principles are coming into our policy. So the national urban transport policy is saying, design your city for people, not vehicles. But when you are making your investment decision, then you are sanctioning only flyovers and expressway, not a pedestrian path. Now that disconnect has to go. So if we can do that and ensure that when we have laws, regulations, we should also have a very strong compliance mechanism. We should have accountability system. And with that, if we have good principles in our policies, we will be able to make that enforceable. But none of that is going to work if we do not change the politics of the issue. And the politics of the issue can change only if you have strong public opinion to influence the politics. I think that's where we need to be. Thank you so much, Anumita. So the, the, if we want to make a large scale change, uh, the, the, the topic of health, the topic of environment, the, the topic of uh, forestation, the topic of preserving the earth around us or the life around us has to become a political issues, issue as well. And as when we are speaking and uh, we were mentioning about a lot of those extreme weather uh, uh, episodes or events happening uh, because of the changing uh, climate which we see uh, i can see the sky outside in delhi the you know very fast winds blowing uh, i can see a lot of plants getting you know in at the flower uh, pots of my balcony uh, getting you know uh, rolled down across the balcony so maybe these are all those symbol and so many earthquake which we you know kind of saw during the last lockdown time they all somehow are again giving a big wake up call even after the snooze button we are pushing so thank you so much uh, the the one message i think i can take forward from this whole uh, session is that uh, more than saving the earth it is about saving ourselves and we can be saved only when we are saving anything and everything around us and i think with that message uh, mrs i would like to conclude this session and before uh, you uh, you know uh, log off uh, i would request my team to play a small video about uh, our ongoing work around good air and how we have been working uh, meticulously with lot of youth uh, school children especially girl child as well to highlight and exhort people that why it is the high time to act for the environment, act for your health, and act for the good air, which can be available to breathe for everyone around you. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining. Anumita Roy Chaudhary, uh, Ms. Alvarez, Dia Mirja for your uh, time and connecting with us, and Dr. Vibhadavan. Thank you so much. We are left with only two choices. Either we go ahead, mend our ways and take the resources more sustainably and responsibly. Or we keep facing such pandemics till our extinction. 
the choices are we can make our earth a better place to live by taking some simple steps like planting a tree throwing waste in proper bins and saying no to plastic bag rather than complaining about pollution such small steps must be taken to make our environment sustainable if we take an action now we can prevent such forthcoming catastrophes in the future with all the large scale of awareness and actions being taken we together can start with a slight change to make a big change tomorrow there are several ways that you yes you can make a difference in this planet we call earth use recyclable bags use reusable containers save electricity save water reuse your notes or don't throw it away last but not the least avoid cars when possible or take a car pool save the electricity save the water and save the natural resources to save the environment driving less walking or cycling more it also helps to save our environment and revive it using organic fertilizers and say no to chemical fertilizers and pesticides will also help us to save our environment now and then we disrespect the nature we disrespect the environment i think it is high time that we prioritize the well-being of our environment and our nature because if we don't nobody else will for us and my point here is that we cannot rely on a pandemic to own up to our mistakes we have to get up and do all we can to save the environment because it is all that we have in common so if you don't keep your environment clean if you just pollute the oxygen if you just cut out the trees then it's actually impossible to survive in this condition because it's already shortage of oxygen and if you just start uh, polluting the oxygen cutting on the trees then it would be really impossible for us human to survive so it's my very plea that uh, please keep your environment clean and respect your trees respect all the environment thank you we are offline himani right sir thank you anumita ji for your time uh, wonderful interaction